being born in Toronto definitely uh, shaped how I see the world, but I don't think I got interested, or at least my education in electricity markets didn't really start until I got to California. So the crazy California um, electricity market will capture anyone's attention. I was a PhD student and I arrived in the aftermath of the crisis. So the state was picking up the pieces, it was the early 2000s, uh, and economists including, uh, you know, I was a graduate student sponge at the lunch table where Frank Wallach and Jim Bushnell and Severin Bornstein and Catherine Wolfram were sort of unpacking the crisis, trying to figure out lessons learned and draw sort of uh, insights for future market design and policy design questions. So it was a really amazing time to be a student of electricity markets. But to make it even more interesting as an environmental economist, at the same time that the California, the state of California was basically re-restructuring its market um, after the crisis, they were also pushing forward with some pretty ambitious, or at least they felt ambitious at the time, uh, environmental policies. So in 2002, we had a 20% by 2020, which seemed really ambitious, maybe not so much in retrospect. Um, and then when I graduated, I got my PhD in 2006, that was the year that the AB32, the Global Warming Solutions Act, was passed, and that pushed a bunch of the carbon price, more aggressive renewables policies into the market, and it interacted with, collided with uh, electricity market impacts. So we've had about more than 15 years of this real world experiment, which may look kind of crazy from the outside, but I think there's a lot to be learned from it. And so when I was thinking about the sort of thematic questions that we are gonna be talking about at the conference, um, and, and the big question I think is just how is the power sector gonna adapt? How should it adapt to a changing technological landscape that includes more renewables, more demand side distributed resources? California um, is, offers a pretty interesting case study. It's captivating, it's held my attention for more than 15 years, but I'm also hoping there's some insights here that are relevant even to other markets that look very different from California but are struggling with or confronting some of the same issues. So, I don't know if they, do they still have Coles Notes in Canada? This is like the Coles Notes quick guide to California's uh, climate goals and in particular, their renewable energy targets. So they've been becoming more and more aggressive as the years go on. Um, We've already hit the 33% that was our target for 2020, and now the state is aiming for 50% by 2030 and a very aspirational 100%, whatever that means, by 2045. So California has basically put itself on the bleeding edge of these questions about how uh, should an electricity market and the policies that shape that market confront or contend with uh, rapid acceleration of renewable resources, primarily wind and solar, so intermittent, um, and also demand side distributed generation. Uh, and this is just another graph to show you, if you haven't been following uh, California so closely, what's been happening with non-hydro renewables. Just a rapid scale up in wind, a rapid scale up in solar, and if you can see the different colors of yellow, the darker yellow is utility scale, and that lighter yellow is distributed sort of rooftop solar. Um, so you know, last we've been breaking records every year. Last year, California got over 30% of its electricity from renewable sources, wind and hydro, but that doesn't include the distributed generation, so that, that share is even higher. So I wanted to today is talk about, so this is a pretty amazing experiment to be pushing in at this very accelerated pace, far faster than the market would have invited renewables um, into the market, thinking about some of the expected impacts, anticipated and how they're showing up, but also I think there's been some unexpected curveballs and ripple effects that weren't anticipated uh, that I think are complicating the challenges ahead, um, but also I think there's some lessons potentially for other jurisdictions. Uh, so that's what I wanted to do, talk about sort of what's been happening, uh, spend a little bit of time looking backwards and how we got here, because uh, I think uh, it is for other jurisdictions, you know, some of the questions that were posed today, you know, do we use a carbon price or a technology mandate or how do we think about uh, resource adequacy? I'm not saying California offers lessons, but it offers some trial and error potentially. Um, and the challenges ahead. And the two developments I've been focusing on today are, are focusing on in California, which have been emphasized today, resource adequacy being one, and uh, the integration of the Western market as a key part of the strategy for renewables integration. And there's some interesting developments there. Okay, so what's been happening in California, when we talk about the impact of accelerated renewal, renewable um, energy deployment in our markets. We talk in terms of ducks, so I'm gonna introduce three. There's a net load duck, there's a wholesale price duck, and there's a net imports duck. If you don't know what the duck I'm talking about, um, let me introduce you to the, the, the first duck. Um, this was a famous, at least in California, duck chart. 
And how I think this came about, or at least what I've been told, is there were some energy analysts, I think they were at Kaiso back in 2013, and they were just doing what analysts do, playing with data, um, and making some projections. And so what this is showing you is this is hours of the day. We'll talk in a minute why they focused on March. And then uh, what they're plotting here is net load, which is load less renewables. And the top, the 2012 and 2013, those are actual data. That's just showing you what happens to load when you subtract the renewables. But then when you project the solar um, generation that was going to be coming online in 2016, 17, 18, 19, 20, what does that increased solar generation do? Well, the sun comes up predictably every day, and it carves out, sort of gouges out that duck belly as you're producing more and more solar when the sun is out. And then the sun sets, typically, every day. And then what happens, you get this really steep evening ramp. Because the sun is setting, but Californians haven't stopped using energy. They're going home, and they're turning on their wine coolers and their pool pumps. And so you need generation to keep up with that demand, right? And so the reason I think this duck chart sort of captured everyone's attention is it's cute. It makes talking about these data fun and interesting. But I think it really uh, elucidated two key challenges with integrating these renewable resources, particularly solar, over generation and possible curtailment in the middle of the day. And when you're not using, we are talking about this this morning, it's really criminal when you're not using this renewable energy resource because you don't have the demand to soak it up. And that steep evening ramp that you're going to have to have resources online to pick up as the sun sets and the renewables generation drops off. Why focus on March? We, like the energy nerds in California call early spring duck season. There's a couple things going on. Fortunately, hopefully we've had water, so we've got hydro resources. Uh, the sun is out and the sun is shining, so your solar panels are generating, but it's not hot yet, so you don't have a lot of air conditioning load. So that's when the duck really shows up, is that sort of um, early spring uh, time. Okay, the important thing to keep in mind about this duck chart, though, is these are analysts. <laughs> There's nothing in here about what the mark, how the market might respond with investments in storage or demand response or anything like that. This is really just forecast net load going forward at, from the perspective of 2013, less the forecast. Um, renewables generation. So the natural question to ask is, has the duck shown up, right? Like we've, the market is going to respond and what's going to happen. I had grand aspirations on my flight over here to get you guys a new duck, but I didn't have time to use, get all the data, so I borrowed someone else's. But this is basically a summary of what duck season has looked like. Same idea, right? Hourly uh, net load um, with the colors dropping down to 2017. And we are seeing that duck belly and we are seeing the evening ramp show up pretty much as expected. Um, and it's interesting to think about, you know, we're, 2020 is three months away, <laughs> and we've got much more ambitious renewable um, integration um, plans to come. So that, you know, we're literally going to go off the chart uh, with that duck belly if we don't make the investments that have started showing up in terms of um, trying to think about storage and demand responses. There's another duck that I wanted to introduce you to, and we'll come back to this one. This is thanks to Catherine Wolfram, and she used it in a blog that she wrote. Um, looking at the effect of wholesale prices. If you really want to understand this duck, I can't recommend enough a paper by Jim Bushnell and Kevin Novin, who looked at the impact of very rapid increases in solar and wind on California energy prices. And their paper documents in great detail, uh, sort of something that's conveyed more simply in this picture, which is the introduction of increased renewables, and in particular solar, has reduced prices on average. We're seeing negative prices in the middle of the day and duck season when you've got just too much solar. And, but the prices are actually peaking or increasing during that ramp to try and draw in the resources we need to keep up um, with the declining solar, if that makes any sense. So reduced prices on average, but prices are trying to do what they're supposed to do, which is draw in the resources to keep up uh, with the ramp. The final duck I wanted to show you, and again, we'll come back when we're talking about where we're going in California, is a duck I made uh, for a blog I wrote earlier this month, and this is just showing you net imports. So California, you know, Hawaii is trying to get to 100% renewable. They're an island in the middle of the ocean. California, fortunately, is not an island. Um, we have neighbors, and we can turn to those neighbors and ask them for some assistance when we have too much solar and we need to export it, or the sun is setting and we need to import. And so you're starting to see this change in, in net imports um, showing up, where we're reducing our imports, or in some hours exporting solar to other states in the middle of the day, but then increasing imports as we needed um, to keep up with that, with that ramp. So that's where we've been, and a lot, of those, uh, a lot of those impacts were predictable. Some of them are sort of side effects. We're not particularly happy about the really low or negative prices. 
But what I wanted to talk about now, before we get where we're going, um, is a little bit of a backward-looking unpacking of how we got here. So it's one thing to mandate we want 30% solar by 2020. It's another thing to make sure those investments happen. And so I wanted to talk about how California has made it happen. Um, and the short answer is policy, right? policy incentives. We were talking about renewable portfolio standards just before lunch. Um, I'm assuming everyone in the room knows how these work, but very quickly, we've just mandated by nice round numbers, by 2020, we want 20% renewables. And that means every load serving entity in California has to make sure that 20% of their kilowatt hours they sell, they can point to a renewable resource and said it came from there. So all load serving entities are required to participate and comply. And since 2002, uh, the investor owned utilities, the big PG&Es and SCEs and SDG&Es have been really instrumental in delivering the investments that are needed to comply with the RPS. Um, and so what I'm showing you here, this is just using data from the RPS program. These are um, average RPS contract prices. These are the contract, these are long-term contracts, 10 plus years, um, that utilities have been signing so that they can comply uh, with this RPS um, <coughs> mandate. And you might be surprised that they're a little low in the earlier years, and that's actually reflecting depreciated small hydro. But once that small hydro was sort of soaked up, you see higher prices because those are contracts for wind and solar, and they're decreasing over time as the technology costs have been decreasing over time. An important thing to note, though, is that that means that there are utilities who have signed these long-term contracts in those early years that looking back, they look pretty expensive, but at the time, they had to sign them to comply with the RPS. And so this has had, and I don't want to overstate, correlation does not imply causation, so I need to be careful here, but this, there has been an interesting, uh, I think there's been some interesting ripple effects from these long-term contracts and a variety of other things that have been happening. There's another, you know, California has so many ABs, you lose count, um, but there's one AB117 that I didn't even know existed until recently. Um, this one signed in the wake of the electricity crisis. Uh, allowed local governments um, to take a more active role in procurement, energy procurement on behalf of their sort of constituents. So you have cities and counties um, that are, that if they so choose, um, they're authorized to act as load serving entities. The utility still takes care of distribution and transmission and retail. Um, and there was not much action. There wasn't a lot of exercising of this option until very recently. And I don't know if people have been following this, but it's been pretty striking. So you didn't see, this is what this graph is showing you is the percent of load, retail load, supplied by these community choice aggregators. And there was just nothing going on. And then until very recently, it just took off. And so now I can't say much about this projection other than it was made by the Public, Public Utility Commission, um, but they've projected that up to 85% of load, retail load, could defect to CCAs or direct access by 2030. So this has been a really big change. And that little detail that I think is kind of interesting is the original AB Assembly Bill not only said you can create these CCAs, but you can default customers into these CCAs. So I was defaulted in, and I was curious, I was preparing this talk, and I coach U8 soccer. And so on the last weekend, I was asking the soccer parents, like, who do you think <laughs> gets your energy? And they said, PG&E, because you're still getting the bill from the PG. We've all just been moved into this, we're the ECBE. Um, we've been moved into this community choice ag aggregator. Most, a lot of customers don't even know. Um, but so you might be wondering, how can these CCAs compete <coughs> with the incumbent? Right? How, how is it that it's taken off? I think there's a lot of factors, so I think I don't want to oversimplify, but I think a couple of key ones are, first, the CCAs are being able to take advantage of the fact that they're not locked into these expensive contracts that the utilities are sort of saddled with. Now, there has been a power charge and difference adjustment that's trying to level the playing field. So when I leave PG&E, I have this bill that's supposed to reflect the contracts that were signed on my behalf, but my sense is that it's not quite doing the job. Um, and then also the CCAs are able to rely on short term. I mean, remember, we've got low prices. We've been pushing these renewables into the market. So low prices, low wholesale prices. So I think there are a number of factors that have meant that the CCAs are more nimble and have been really able to come into this market um, in, in a big way. So when we think about the RPS policy, um, it's accelerated investment in wind and solar, certainly, as, as intended. I think it had to have played a role in accelerating the fragmentation of the retail market. 
um, uh, into these uh, CCAs and local providers. And we're going to come back to this, but I think that this is, or at least from my perspective, I'd be interested to hear from Frank and Jim, who've been thinking about this market um, uh, for longer than I have. This does complicate questions of resource adequacy when you have many more entities that are now responsible for procuring on behalf of retail customers. But we'll come back to that. Okay, so I also want to talk about behind the meter because we've been talking about distributed generator generation at this conference and this has been another uh, big development in California and just to remind you, you've seen a big increase um, in uh, residential and commercial distributed solar. I have to remind people in this room, I don't think I have to remind you, but it's still the case that distributed this retail and commercial solar, small scale solar is still more expensive. The costs have been coming down, but there's still economies of scale. So the utility scale solar is still a cheaper, more efficient option. So you might ask, why are we seeing such a striking increase in investment in rooftop solar in California? And the answer is net metering. Net metering had a huge role to play. It's not the only incentive out there, but it's a really powerful one in California. And I know you have one in Ontario. I'll tell you a little bit more about how it works in California. So the basic idea is the same. So my neighbor has solar panels on her house, and that means that for every kilowatt hour she consumes, she's credited at the retail rate. So if she's using her blender during the day and her panels are operating, you know, she can use her own electricity, she's making her own, she doesn't need to buy it from the utility. But also when the sun has gone down, if she's over-generated, which she has, she's certainly sized her system, so she's making more than she's consuming contemporaneously, she's able to use that at night and get credit for the solar generation she didn't use in the middle of the day. Um, and I think why this is uh, the important thing to note uh, about California and other states in the US is that the retail price, the price you're paying per kilowatt hour, reflects not only the cost of making that power, the fuel and the, the labor inputs that are making the kilowatt hours as you consume them, but it also reflects a significant chunk of that is fixed and sunk infrastructure costs. Another plug for a Jim Bushnell paper with Severin Bornstein where they've looked across the country and just looked at like what that sort of fixed cost component is and what the retail price is compared to the sort of social marginal cost. But the key here is that when my neighbor is using her solar panels, those fixed costs that she's avoiding are not avoided, <laughs> they are shifted. <laughs> and that wasn't such a big problem when it was a small number of households, you know, those like hippy dippy Berkeley types that were putting PV panels on their homes. But it's a much larger share of the market. So that's, you know, you're moving those fixed costs onto a smaller and smaller base. You might be arguing, at least if you're a student in my Berkeley class, <laughs> but we should be compensating these households. You know, they're helping us move to a cleaner energy future, and it's true that there are benefits, there are emissions we're avoiding, but I think the point is, and this is like fast and loose math, but retail rates, I envy the gentleman from Quebec who's paying five cents a kilowatt hour. We're paying close to 20 cents per kilowatt hour on average, the rounded average. And if you think about our wholesale electricity prices are about five cents per kilowatt hour, there's a big chunk of that retail price that is not the, the, the private costs. And I send you to Jim's paper for a pretty convincing argument that the retail price per kilowatt hour is, kilowatt hour is well above the social marginal cost that includes the social cost of carbon and local emissions. So that means we are conferring a, a subsidy um, and over incentivizing, I would argue, um, distributed solar in California. But that's some inefficiency and maybe we're not too, you know, depending on your utility function, maybe you're not gonna lose sleep over that kind of inefficiency. Here's another problem that I think we, should, we are losing sleep over in California and it's the equity, the distributional implications. So like I said, when you have more and more people, so California just mandated solar PV on all new homes. That's gonna increase, increase, increase the number of PV owners. And the equity distributional problem is that we're shifting fixed costs from the adopters who tend to be higher income, not always, but on average, to the non-adopters who tend to be low income renters. And that is just not a sustainable model. Um, so the, right now, uh, the debate in California over the distributional implications of rising electricity prices and who's paying and who's not is reaching a fever pitch. And maybe the silver lining is it might force some re rate restructuring, which is probably overdue. So in summary, some takeaways before we've been looking in the back rear view mirror, we're gonna go forward. Um, but in summary, I think uh, from our experience, California has relied much more. So we do have a carbon price. It's not that high. So it's really been the RPS that's been driving the investment in renewables. Um, and I think it's worth 
acknowledging uh, that a RPS that subsidizes green but doesn't penalize the emissions externality is a fairly crude way to reduce uh, emissions via increased investment in renewables. That's not to say renewables mandates don't have other purposes in terms of meeting other market failures, but at the end of the day, that is it's kind of a crude approach. And it's worth saying um, that all, you know, because all qualifying renewables receive the same kind of subsidy under the RPS, there's real inefficiencies that, because there's no sense in which the market incentives are steering the renewables to where they're most valuable. Uh, we're seeing those low prices. Um, I think these are all sort of a consequence of of our policy instrument choice and the extent to, we rely, the extent to which we relied on mandates uh, versus pricing. Net metering, I think uh, hopefully the explanation was clear, but it's really exacerbated inefficiencies associated. Um, Severin Bornstein calls it sloppy rate making, like recovering your fixed, the, the rates aren't really well aligned with how the costs are structured. And that's fine um, for a while, but now uh, the extent to which we're relying on net metering is exacerbating the inefficiencies associated with that so-called sloppy rate making, rate, rate making. Okay, so that's where we've been and that's how we've gotten here. Um, and there've been some twists and turns and unexpected outcomes along the way. Now I wanna talk about where we're going um, in terms of rising or meeting the renewables integration challenge. So like I said, we're at, you know, th we've already met our 30% target, but we're not slowing down. We're going to 45, 50% renewables in California. And that's going to mean that those integration challenges, the oversupply and curtailment, the steep ramping, the intermittency is going to get, it's just going to get more challenging to deal with. The fortunate uh, reality is that we have lots of levers we can pull as we try and manage those integration challenges. So we've talked about a lot of them today, um, investing in more flexible generation, demand response, storage, optimized grid operations. The question that California is asking, and I think the answer is clear, um, is are our current market and policy incentives up to the task of coordinating all these different strategies efficiently, right? deploying the right combination so we rise to meet the integration challenges in the least cost efficient way. And I think the answer is probably no. <laughs> so we need to do more sort of regulation and policy intervention to try and get the answer right. Um, so when we think about, for example, we're gonna need more flexible and ramping resources, but the problem is we pushed all this solar and wind into the grid, and so the prices, wholesale prices are really low. And so that means that some of the existing gas plants that we need to stick around are seriously challenged. Um, and so there's a concern that existing market incentives forget incentivizing new flexible capacity are they even enough to keep our existing flexible capacity in the market. Um, and so this is getting to Frank's talk uh, that we did and, and Blake, what Blake were talking about. In California, we don't have a capacity market. We have resource adequacy requirements. So load serving entities need to sign long-term contracts or guarantee that they have sufficient resources to meet their peak and then some, there's a reserve margin. So what I think is really interesting, um, sort of that adds complexity to the conversation we had before lunch, which is you know, how do you ensure long-term resource adequacy I think that problem has gotten more complicated given the changes we're observing in the retail side with customer defection to much more, many more fragmented, smaller um, community choice aggregators. And I think that there is, again, I'm not directly involved in the debate, but I'm certainly watching it closely. Um, there's concern about delegating, like how to delegate responsibility to this more fragmented, heterogeneous group of uh, retail participants. Is resource adequacy value adequately reflected? You know, the flexibility we need, the operational attributes, the location. Um, and then there's this interesting tension between, I mean, if, I, if you talk to, so I've been going to my board meetings of my community choice aggregator and they're really playing up the local nature. We are talking to you, we know what you need. We can think about the DR solutions that this community could use. And I think there's a real appeal to that, but it's a tension between delegating and having the local entities plan and optimize, but then when we add it all up, we have a combination of investments that really meets our system-wide needs. So I think that there's some interesting tension there. And the thing that I'm, I'm hearing, and again, I'd be interested to hear from the folks who are also following California, it's almost as if the retail market fragmentation is pushing us towards a more centralized, integrated resource plan. There's talk of needing a master plan and a central planner to take care of it. So there's a little bit of sort of tension and maybe even irony there. Um, so that's the resource adequacy. The other element, and it's related, that I'm just fascinated by, and I'm talking to people here and have already got some follow-up conversations, um, is thinking about regional market integration. 
right? We're not an island. We are connected with other resources in other states. Um, and that can really help us in terms of integrating uh, intermittent renewable resources more in a least costly fashion. But the reality is the West is still 38 fragmented balancing areas. They're connected by wires, but my sense is that there are still frictions in the extent to which we're coordinating across those balancing areas. And there's a general sense that a more integrated Western market would do a lot for re renewable energy integration. You know, if we have too much solar, we can send it to you. We can build wind where it's cheap and you can send it to us. We can sort of uh, coordinate across all balancing areas when we're thinking about investing in flexible ramping capacity. So California did embark on, or did, there was a push for Western power market integration. Uh, it failed. Um, it, it was complicated. I don't want to oversell sort of the angle or the, the element that I'm going to focus on here. But one important sticking point um, was that a more integrated market brings all sorts of efficiency gains and sort of coordinating across markets. But the research that I do really focuses on a different dimension, which is California has a very different level of climate change mitigation ambition than our neighbors. We have a carbon price and we have a bunch of regulations that is really trying to drive down emissions in California. California is less than 1% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. <laughs> and so the concern is, is if you raise the price of doing business or generating electricity in California, what you might do is just shift the electricity generation out of state and so now what we've done is we're celebrating our in-state emissions reductions, but we're increasing our out-of-state emissions reductions. And perversely, we could, you know, one-to-one -one offset it, given that the generation outside of California is more carbon intensive. I think I'd like to highlight the fact, I think it's not widely appreciated that we're talking about border tax adjustments more and more as we think about sort of the future. California actually has something like a border tax adjustment. So under the cap and trade program in California, you got to purchase a permit to offset every ton of carbon you emit in California. But deliverers of electricity to California also have to pay for the carbon that's embedded in those electri electricity units that are flowing across the border. And many of you are already thinking, probably already seeing where this is going. Well, that's fine. But when I stand at the border and start collecting carbon permits from the electricity flowing into California, what's going to happen? Those low carbon resources outside of California are gonna say, I'll go to California, and they will come because they are low carbon, but then there's contractor resource shuffling outside of California, so that we're not turning off coal plants, we're just on paper sort of reallocating where those electrons are flowing. But California is trying to deal with that as well, um, in the sense that um, we have a market design that's trying to take account of resource shuffling and secondary dispatch. I get ahead of myself. What I wanna come back to this, that I think a big part of why, or a part of why, the move to integrate regional markets failed was there was real concern that a more integrated market would facilitate more efficient market operations, but could exacerbate leakage concerns and, and resource shuffling, and that California would lose some of its ability to act autonomously to determine how its state regulations impact electricity flows in and out of the state. So there's real concern about governance and autonomy. So this is why there's a little, little market in California that I think has some promise, but I don't want to over-promise. The energy imbalance market, uh, some of you may have heard of it, it's a short run, intra-hour, like last minute market, right? So it's the like, last minute true ups balancing um, uh, of resources ac across participants in the West. It's a voluntary market, so you can sort of volunteer, and if you volunteer to supply California, then you pay a carbon adder. So this little market has been demonstrating a couple things. It's been demonstrating that curtailment seems to be, it seems to be reducing curtailment, at least relative to day ahead scheduling, because you can optimize very nimbly across participating resources. And it's also got the only FERC approved carbon adder that they charge, uh, they charge carbon coming into imports. It also attempts to deal with secondary dispatch. It sort of estimates how much resource shuffling might go on. It uses a default emissions rate to sort of penalize EIM participants according to that sort of secondary dispatch emissions. So I think it's, it's, a, it's an example, it's a work in, a proof of concept maybe, or a work in progress of how we might negotiate and take advantage of integrated markets while also preserving the integrity, more or less, of the greenhouse gas accounting in California. So there is now a move to build on the success and scale up to a day ahead market. 
I can, I've done no research on this, so I don't have a good sense of like the real efficiency gains that that could bring. But I think it's an interesting development um, in terms of trying to integrate the Western um, electricity markets more uh, deeply to lower renewables integration costs. And the one piece that I've been focusing on the most is thinking about when you scale up, how do you scale up that greenhouse gas accounting? Because we're trading with a bunch of different states every day, different states are adopting different greenhouse gas policies. So how do you sort of reconcile our policy differences in order to facilitate trade between jurisdictions with different appetite for greenhouse gas emissions reduction. So I think it's a really interesting intersection of market design and policy design in the interest of accelerating um, investments in renewables. So in sum, uh, maybe going over time, uh, I think in California, someone made this point before lunch. California is clearly serious about carbon mitigation, but I don't think our tolerance is infinite. People are starting to get very concerned about the costs uh, that our carbon mitigation strategies are imposing on customers. I also think it's really important to keep in mind that the reason renewable integration is like a linchpin to California's climate change mitigation strategy is electrification. So we want people out of their gas cars into electric cars. We want people you know, turning off their gas stoves and turning on electric stoves. Who's going to jump from their gas-fueled car to an electric car if electricity prices are 25 cents per kilowatt hour? So there's a lot of so rate design meets greenhouse gas emissions um, reductions challenges ahead. Um, so I think the punchline here is the new renewable energy investments in California are exciting. Um, but they're going to fall short of their real potential if we plug them into markets and regulations that aren't designed to accommodate them. And that's a work in progress in California. And the key challenges ahead, um, this is by no means an exhaustive list, but this uh, designing policy and market incentives to align cost allocation with cost causation is essential because the stakes are getting higher and higher. Um, retail rate reform in California, particularly to address mounting concerns about both efficiency and distributional concerns. That's a big one. And finally, and this is more my wonky issue, but I still think it's an important issue, striking a balance between seamlessly integrating regional markets so we can really leverage or exploit gains from trade and reduce the cost of renewables integration, while also sort of to the best of our ability, uh, accounting for differences in policy incentives, greenhouse gas accounting and differences across um, states is going to be an important part to making this all work well. So I'll end there. Look forward to your questions and comments. Thanks.